Welcome back. I am Colonel Melinda Eaton. Uh, the final session of the morning will feature four speakers, each bringing their own perspective to military medicine and the impact of medical research to delivery of warfighter medical care. Our first speaker, Sergeant First Class Retired Luke Shuley, will be introduced by Dr. Melissa Givens, Department of Military and Emergency Medicine, Uniformed Services University. Dr. Givens. Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be up here and introduce you to Luke Shuley. He's gonna to talk to you about his experiences, but the reason I'm up here introducing him is because I want you to know how insightful this young man is and how much he can contribute to the military health system and to the greater civilian world. I got to know Luke when COVID was raging in New York City. In the early um, part of the pandemic in New York when things were really at a crisis state, we stood up a field hospital and responded to the pandemic. Luke was one of the first to volunteer and come share his skills. And not only did he share up, show up and volunteer, he really shined as a leader. And even after we shut down the field hospital and the rest of us went home, Luke stayed in New York and really advanced medicine along with New York Presbyterian. And so I have seen him just shine in every example. And I think you're really fortunate to hear his story. So I hope um, you enjoy him. Luke, I'm going to go ahead and bring you up. Thanks, Missy. So my name is Luke Shuley. Uh, I'm going to give a, a quick presentation, a little bit of an AAR, a little bit of a clinical evaluation, and some hard lessons learned uh, that I went through that I think that a lot of people in this room, especially the people who are still wearing uniform, uh, hopefully some of this hits home with you. Uh, we're going to cover some good things. We're going to cover some bad things. I'm going to tell you my story and why I try to continue to tell this story, especially on a government-funded platform or there's government entities involved, because these are where some of the, the, the challenges that I ran into can be addressed. We'll try to bridge the gap on the civilian side as far as how some of the, th the things that we're doing on the civilian side also have uh, extreme impacts on the Department of Defense side. So like you see here is January 18th, 2018, 0305 in the morning. I found myself in a nice neighborhood in the Nalazad district of Helmand Province, Afghanistan. Uh, and we were conducting a, a small village clearance operation. Well, before we get started, next slide. So like I mentioned is we're gonna cover some things uh, in this discussion. Some of them are gonna be uncomfortable. Some of them are gonna be our failures. Some of them are gonna be my failures. And some of them might not be in the best limelight for the organizations that are here. I'm gonna say these things on behalf of myself. I don't represent the uh, 10th Special Forces Group, the United States Special Operations Commands, 1st Special Forces Command, the Department of Defense, uh, or, or the U.S. Army. I also, I also work for Carnegie Mellon University. The things that I'm covering in this lecture, separate from my lecture tomorrow, is not on behalf of the university as well. The focus of this story for me is to tell you how I went from the guy on the left to the person on the right. How I went from becoming a Green Beret to an advocate for the Department of Defense, Special Operations, Medics, and taking care of our wounded warrior population. So like I mentioned earlier, is we were conducting a village clearance operation. It was uh, the ODA that I was on, four additional special operations ODAs, seven CH-47s, one UH-60, four special operations CANDACs, and one national interdiction unit. The primary objective of uh, this particular mission was a village clearance operation where we were infilling to the north, clearing to the south, at a predetermined limit of advance, which happened to have been a Taliban madrasa. If you've spent some time in the military, you can probably understand what happens in the madrasa and why we were using this as our limit of an advance. Uh, my, my position, although I was the senior detachment medic, is I was also the assault leader for uh, our CQB-1 element. Uh, my primary objective was to get to that madrasa, set up a stronghold, conduct counterintelligence, and then assist in personnel recovery out of the Taliban-controlled prison, which was across the street. So team internal medical, medical situation, just to give you a quick rundown, is although I was uh, the senior medic for the team, is I was also uh, in a assault leader position. This was something that me and my boss went back and forth on as far as whether or not it was a, uh, a good position for me to be in. 
And the worst case scenario is, is what we ended up going through. Uh, his argument was always that if something happens tactically and we need to get our medics involved, my medic can't be an assault team leader. My argument being a stubborn SF guy is, is you're always a Green Beret first and whatever else is secondary. Uh, we went round and round through that deployment. Uh, finally, I was in that assault leader position. The junior medic that was there, great dude, uh, it was his first deployment. Uh, he was located in the rear of the element with the C2 element, uh, and we got separated once we got to that uh, prison, which we'll take another look at, is we got into a gunfight, we got split up from the leadership element, and conveniently enough is our warrant officer, who people say don't do anything in the military, was also a prior 18 Delta, uh, and it was good because we needed a second set of medical hands. So leading up to the point of injury, you can see there uh, in the top part of that uh, picture, is that's the madrasa where we were held up on. We started having issues with our partner force. We noticed a decrease in the security amongst our Afghan counterparts is they quit wearing their night vision goggles, they were sleeping, they weren't carrying their weapons. On top of that is we started getting shot at from the buildings in the bottom left corner. So we knew that there was a physical threat. There was a tank in the middle between the madrasa and the prison. We went to uh, the tank there, we set up a small drone to take a look into the prison just to make sure, or just to see what was going on on the other side. Uh, we noticed that there were, you know, the Taliban knew that we were there. They were moving machine guns and stuff to get ready to ambush us coming through the building. Uh, so we threw a couple hand grenades over the fence or over the wall, which was about 14 feet tall, uh, and we moved to our breach point. So our original breach point was the blue circle in the bottom left corner of the prison, and as soon as me and another guy went around that corner, we started getting shot at. The problem with the, the well, there's a couple of different problems. So one is the plan now changed. So I made a decision to change our breach point from the uh, uh, southwest wall to the west wall, but I had already tied in a six pound C4 charge. Anybody familiar with ballistics or uh, explosives? Anybody? How far back should you be from a six pound C4 charge? Long ways. Long ways. So I had a 30 foot initiation system, which is about a third of what it probably should be. And I was already tied into it. So I took a six pound C4 charge that was supposed to go through a four foot wall and I put it on a wooden door. Because at three o'clock in the morning under night vision, you're not gonna sit there and try to untie it. And we were getting shot at. So I took the six pound C4 charge, said this will probably do, and, uh, and moved back. So I put the charge on where that lightning bolt was, and I moved back to where those two green uh, circles were at, and I was there with a buddy of mine, his name is Andrew, and that whole morning, we had been doing these six pound C4 charges with 30 foot initiation systems, because we never double checked what our MSD or our minimum safe distance was. So the MSD for six, one is you probably shouldn't even be using six pounds of C4, but Again, like I'm a dumb SF guy, like if you don't know more, just add to it. And that's exactly what I was doing, but with explosives. So if you're taking notes, don't do it. Uh, so the whole time, like we were eating these C4 charges, like we'd put a charge on a wall and then me and my buddy Andrew, we would take turns hiding behind each other so that his body would shield me from the blast and then my body would shield him from the blast. Who does TBI research? <laughs> Let's talk after. Uh, so, you know, we get behind this corner, and although we were getting shot at, like, I remember I was on a knee, I'm sitting next to Andrew, and I'm like, hey, man, at least we're not going to eat this one. Like, this is going to be the best breach we've had yet. At least we have some cover. So I pull the initiators, the breach goes off. So, lo and behold, the building that we were building, uh, breaching into, so now this is, this is from the north to the south, looking at the building. That building blows up. So on the inside is... The EOD team that was with us and some of the other guys that were there, we had a jet advisor with us. They found some 55-gallon drums, some remnants of HME in the building that we were breaching into uh, almost simultaneously exploded. So whether it was a sympathetic detonation or an overpressure that led to an explosion of another IED, the building blew up. That arrow that's right there is where me and Andrew um, got stuck. On top of all that, now we got re-engaged in another gunfight. 
my team sergeant who was uh, on the other side of the tank, he got knocked unconscious and nobody else was with us. The other guys that were a part of my SF element were out doing their own operations. The Afghans that work with us don't speak English. And it was the only, the only way that people really knew what was going on other than the explosion was they came to find my boss and he was walking around the middle of the street. I mean, there's, I mean, it's not a hellacious gunfight, but there's people shooting at each other. And he was walking around in circles in the middle of the street talking nonsense on his radio. Somebody came back and got him. Finally, he kind of comes to, and he remembers where we were at. The dust had settled. They moved another SF uh, contingent over to start working the debris off of us. Um, some of those pieces, they, they looked big, but they were extremely heavy. We couldn't, all these, the guys that were on the ground couldn't even pick them up. So we ended up, or we didn't, I didn't do anything. They went, they found a car, took the car jack from the spare tire and lifted up all the pieces of debris with a car jack spare tire uh, manual lift. So initial impressions is I knew that I was pinned under a building. I knew that Andrew was with me. I couldn't reach my comms. I couldn't hear because my comms had been knocked off, and I couldn't see because my nods were damaged. I knew that I wasn't dead, but I knew that I was not in a good position. I knew that I was either paralyzed or still pinned, and then straight panic. So you might be asking, what's the difference between panic and straight panic? So panic is like probably what you're used to. Straight panic is whenever you're doing a operation at three o'clock in the morning where you're supposed to be quiet, and instead, you're sitting underneath a building screaming for help because you have no idea what's going on. And that's exactly what happened to me, is I knew that we were actively engaged in an enemy fight, and I could not hold it together because I was terrified about what had just happened. I completely lost sight and visibility on the fact that we were actively engaged in a gunfight and lost my mind based off of what happened. So as I'm screaming for help, the other guys are coming over, and again, like I, I, I wasn't 100% convinced that I was paralyzed at the time. I thought that whatever happened, everything was on top of me. I couldn't see anything. I really couldn't feel anything. My sensation was all messed up, but I didn't know exactly how bad it was. So point of, eye, uh, point of injury care, the, uh, the recovery team kind of came over, got everything off of us. We, clo we called in close air support. Luckily for me, as we still had A-10s. Um, 15 minutes to get me out, 45 minutes to get my buddy out. Initial impression from the medic on the ground was they thought that I either had a broken femur, pelvis, uh, neck, and shoulder injury. I, I was unable to move. They tried to extremity carry me, started pain management via 800 micrograms of fentanyl, and then moved me back to the madrasa where we set up a CCP. They got an IV in me, uh, did some improvised immobilization, and then pain medications and sedation with ketamine and Versed. Andrew, the guy next to me, had four broken ribs. I don't know how. The story I tell is that my body protected him, and that's why this happened. But So they moved us back to uh, the, the madrasa, and we called in medevac. Next slide. So the extraction. We called in the medevac. The nine line went in at zero, uh, 0344. I didn't get medevac until 0445. So the helicopter, the HLZ that we were in, uh, the hasty HLZ that we were gonna use, it was too small. So the helicopter gets overhead, says they can't land there, there's not enough room for the aircraft, they don't have hoist capability with them, and although we had it on the ground, they didn't have it in the air. So we had to move all the way back to our infill HLZ, which is about 300 meters away. Uh, it took us a little bit of time to get there, we had to black back clear through all those buildings because now they had been occupied by bad guys and it took us about an hour to get there. Just a quick little write-up from uh, the medevac crew that was there. The biggest takeaway from this is I never carried a pelvic splint because they took up too much space and there was no good way to carry a cervical collar in my aid bag. Uh, we were doing a bunch of stuff where we were flying in on helicopters and then we were walking whatever the distance was to wherever we were going and there's an old saying that ounces make pounds and pounds make pain and if I didn't have to carry it, I wasn't carrying it. So it was at this point that I finally got a pelvic immobilization device on. Quick little write-up from the forward surgical team. I know it's a little bit tough to tell. Uh, this was where they did a, a little bit more of a diagnostic, not necessarily imagery, but they had a little bit more time to take a look at what was going on. 
and this is for me whenever things started to getting a little bit real, is I started having worsening sensation and range of motion on my left side. Uh, they put a C-collar on. I started having suspicion of a spinal cord injury. Uh, anal tone has already started to be decreased. And they started preparing to send me to CAF, uh, the Roll 3, for more diagnostic imagery. So if you spend any time in Kandahar, especially as a medical provider, this might look familiar to you. This is the ICU in CAF. CAF Roll 3, just a little bit more of a, a write-up as far as uh, what they found there. So finally, now I get, the, I, I get confirmation that I broke C4, 5, and 6. I had a right scapular fracture and a left acetabular fracture. Uh, and I was pending transport to launch stool for uh, neurosurgery and spinal decompression surgery. This was also the, face, uh, the first Asia test I had taken. Uh, so I was categorized as an Asia D, stayed in Asia D throughout the entirety of the process. So a quick write-up from launch stool is C5 vertebral uh, body fracture, C4, 5 lamina fracture, C6 compression fracture, everything else that you guys can see up there. Um, the neurosurgeon that was in Afghanistan at the time didn't have the equipment to be able to do it, although they wanted to uh, do the decompression surgery faster and sooner. They didn't have the resources available to them to do it in calf. So he flew with me to launch stool, and I had decompression surgery done in launch stool. Not one of my best pictures. This is the uh, ICU in, uh, in launch stool. This shows a, a pretty good picture of the anterior and the posterior uh, fusion C4 through C6 on the anterior and uh, C3 through T1 on the posterior. I stayed in launch stool for about 24 hours. Uh, they flew my family to Germany to meet with me just because of the severity of the injury. And then we flew back together uh, on a C-17 Millbird with the CCAT team uh, from launch stool to Walter Reed. Here's a quick little addendum that got added to my records. Um, basically, is it says that at one point throughout the transport, my ventilator quit working and that they had to continue to manually ventilate me or uh, manually, uh, yeah, ventilate me with an AMBU bag because the two backup generator or ventilators they had also quit working. If you spent any time working with manual ventilation, it's hard to do good. We might think that we do it good, but you squeezing it five times really fast and then not touching it for 12 seconds is not good ventilation. Uh, and this is one of the areas that, so I ended up getting diagnosed with an anoxic brain injury, and I think that this is probably one of the instances or the instance that caused it. So my wife at the time was a nurse, was riding in the C-17 with me, and I'm, I'm not putting anybody on blast with this, email, or with this addendum, but she was sitting in the back of a C-17, started noticing that alarms and stuff were going off. Nobody else picked up on the fact that the alarms were going off. I ended up vomiting, and she couldn't get a hold of anybody in the, in the aircraft and had to start like manually taking some of that stuff out of my airway before somebody came over and started picking up ventilations. So, get to Walter Reed. I get issued my first Army-issued uh, power wheelchair. I would have that wheelchair for the next six months. Uh, I spent a little bit of time in the ICU at Walter Reed, and then I had reconstructive pelvic surgery. My chain of command had come down to Walter Reed because we had seven other guys injured within about a two-week period, and uh, we did our ceremonies and stuff at the hospital. So, had reconstructive pelvic surgery from the less acetabular fracture. Uh, I was having a little bit of issues with my blood pressure in the ICU, so the orthopedic surgeon that was there uh, they actually had a cadaver come in where they could break the cadaver, break the cadaver's pelvis in a way that was similar to mine. They were able to practice the surgery the day before doing the surgery, and then the following day I had surgery. So this is what the end product looked like. So I spent about a month and a half at Walter Reed. Uh, Walter Reed, amazing hospital, super up to date, plenty of resources, a lot of other wounded warriors at the time doesn't have a spinal cord injury program. So we ask about the spinal cord injury program, and apparently there's one in Tampa. So the Tampa VA has a spinal cord injury program that they transferred me to, and I was there for another, from 26 February through 26 May. 
Some additional diagnoses outside of the spinal cord injury, incomplete tetraplegia, spasticity, neurogenic bladder, insomnia, all the other ones that were up there, is I got admitted to that, uh, that hospital on an inpatient uh, status, spent a couple months there before being discharged. One of the things that we're going to revisit is the resources that are available, how they're used, and where they're implemented at. UPMC. So UPMC is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Anybody from the Department of Defense have a relationship with UPMC for active duty status? We don't have one. So whenever I was in the Tampa VA and they were getting ready to discharge me because I was able to start walking again, my unit was ready for me to come back to service. And so was I. I wanted to go back to service. I was at 10 Special Forces Group out of Fort Carson, Colorado, and I was dying to come back. There is no spinal cord injury program capable of being run at a special operations unit like 10 Special Forces Group. The group is designed to fight wars and to go to war, not to be able to deal with highly complex recoveries like spinal cord injuries. So I found my own. I went through my insurance company while I was in the hospital, while still on active duty, and found a facility that specialized in spinal cord injuries to, that would take me as an active duty service member for me to do outpatient physical therapy because the DOD didn't have something for me available. I spend, I, and I, st I still go to UPMC for outpatient rehab. So I got discharged back to my home of record just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then I had some additional complications. I end up getting uh, re-hospitalized. Back down at the Tampa VA for the post-deployment rehab and evaluation program. Has anybody heard of this program? A couple hands out there. So it's a, it's a relatively new program. It's a great resource for active duty and uh, veteran service members. Uh, they do everything. Uh, the focus is, is primarily on mental health and physical well-being. It was, I was there for about two and a half months. So we're going to go down a hole a little bit, and then it'll get better and positive at the end. Everything for me changed on that day. Absolutely everything. I never would have expected it. I loved everything that I did in the Army. Every single second of it. Absolutely every single second of it. I would have done anything for this country, the unit, the regiment. Hands down. On any given day, I would sacrifice whatever it had to be to do it. And I would do it all over again. Every single time. Do I wish maybe I would have used a smaller C4 charge? Maybe. But the reality of it is, is that Jay changed my life forever. And just like you see here is I felt like I lost my career, my purpose, my drive, my health, my mental health, my mind, my life, and my marriage. And the way that you see these things here was part of my problem is these are how I prioritize things then and sometimes even now, where I put my career above the things that were way more important, like my family and my marriage and all of those things I sacrificed, knowingly sacrificed, to support what I was doing within the Department of Defense for the U.S. government. And I wouldn't change it again, but it changed my perspective a lot. One of the things that was super hard for me to deal with is the fact that I put my career above everything else. My wife, my mom, my friends, my health, everything. I put my career above it all. And I felt like the Department of Defense and the US government and the Army failed me on a lot of different things. And we're gonna talk about some of those things. I know that some of the people in the crowd are coming from a civilian side this is something that has to be brought up for a number of different reasons. And it's not a bad thing. It is what it is. But we can get better. The first thing I'm going to talk about, and, and there's a lot of medical people in this who might have the ability to inf influence some of these changes, is I called home after I got hurt, and they wanted my family to meet me in Germany. My wife buys the ticket. The Army doesn't pay for it. She buys a flight to Germany is for 24 hours later for $3,500 and we eat the bill. Award paperwork. I don't give, I don't care about 
any single medals that I've received, from bronze stars to purple hearts to whatever it is. My team sergeant put me in for a Valor Award during the deployment for something that had happened. And six months later, I follow up with them. After everybody comes home, you know, the war's won, we come back. And I asked him, I said, hey man, whatever happened to, you know, some of the paperwork? And the answer was, the unit had enough Valor Awards to get the Presidential Valorous Unit Award, so they quit accepting Valor Awards. So we never process your paperwork. I said, fuck it, it's okay, that's fine. It is what it is. Expectation versus reality at Tampa VA. So I'm at Walter Reed, somebody, a case manager comes in and says, hey, we have this great facility down in Tampa for spinal cord injury patients. It's at this VA, it's in Tampa, it's great. They have the best program, the DOD, it's their premier spinal cord injury center. And he gives me a book and he shows me the rooms, the rehab equipment and the program that goes into this program. So I agree to go down to Tampa. The brochure was for a different program. Different rooms, different equipment, different program. It wasn't even the same, it wasn't even the same program. Somebody from the Department of Defense working on behalf of the federal government was giving me information about where to go do spinal cord injury rehab and had never even seen the building. Lack of SCI resources, I brought it up, as I had to find my own spinal cord injury rehab program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Anybody from Colorado know a good hospital in Denver that's got a spinal cord injury program? Anybody ever hear of Craig Hospital? One of the best spinal cord injury hospitals in the country that would have been 20 minutes from where I was working? There was an option for active duty service members to go there to get treatment that nobody knew about. PCS to the WTU. So my unit, two months after getting injured, says that we don't know how to deal with you. We're gonna send you to the Warrior Transition Unit for you to continue rehab. The same unit that I ended up sacrificing relationships with my family, marriage, health, and mind, two months after getting injured, was trying to send me to somebody else to take care of me because they don't want to do it. Household goods. I get discharged from the hospital. All of my stuff is still in Colorado. The Army can't figure out how to get my stuff from Colorado to Pittsburgh. I had to have a group of guys that I work with rent a U-Haul and drive across the country together just to get me my own clothes. The WTU prep program. The prep program was a mental health and evaluation program to get guys back into the force. The WTU wanted to kick me out of the Army before letting me attend the prep program. There was three Purple Heart recipients in the WTU program out of 220 people there with me, and I had two of them. There was one other guy that was there, another SF guy that was there, and they refused to take care of us and some of the other people the way that it should have been done because it was too much work for them to do. It was too much facilitation. Nobody had ever had to go to an inpatient or an outpatient rehab program since they've been in charge there. Retirement and PA. So I find out that the Army has a cap on how many days you can be on a profile during rehab, and they cut me retirement orders while I'm at home. Not exactly how I planned on retiring from the Army was a piece of paper that says, congratulations, we've retired you from the US military. DD-214 and retirement award, same thing. They send me my DD-214 on it. It's missing two deployments. It's missing three schools. It's missing awards. My name isn't spelled right on it. They still couldn't get it right. And I had to pay out of, out of pocket to travel to the WTU. So the only reason I bring up some of these things, nothing on here is super relevant to me. None of the, none of the things that are on here are gonna change my life. But what it showed me was the amount of time and effort that I put into the regiment, I didn't get it back. And that's where we have to be better. The number in the corner is 6,919 6, killed in the last 40 years of war between Iraq and Afghanistan. Over 53,000 injured. How many other people have similar stories to this that we have failed to take care of? All right, that's it. That's all the bad stuff. We're moving on to the good stuff. So what do I do now? Is I work full time for Carnegie Mellon, doing research and development on a couple other projects, and we're gonna talk about some of them. I also have a little consulting company. I do some humanitarian work. I teach Sig Sauer 
uh, work for the Special Forces Foundation and fly for Stat Medevac. One of the projects and why, one of the ones that's super relevant to this conference is a project that we do with Pitt and Carnegie Mellon developing uh, artificial intelligence and robotics for trauma care. I know that one of the other uh, presenters this morning talked about a virtual learning platform that the Army is using as a sustainment program. I'm fortunate enough to be one of the subject matter experts on that program. Uh, there's another uh, spinal cord injury government funded project through John Hopkins for spinal cord injury development that I'm, I, I'm extremely excited to be a part of. As Missy was stating, is this was another uh, opportunity that I've had post-retirement from the military to continue to not only work on the civilian side, but to help empower veterans that have got out, transitioned out of the military, and get them back into a meaningful workforce. Uh, this was a really good eye-opening experience, I think, for a lot of people, both on the civilian and the military side. Uh, and it's one of the things that I continue to try to do now as a civilian is to figure out ways to bridge the gap in both uh, employment and credentialing for specifically our special operations medics, how to get them more increased educational opportunities uh, in the U.S. and out of the U.S. I spent the probably, uh, I got to Ukraine on February 28th. I've spent probably uh, 130 days there maybe uh, working with the Ukrainian military, uh, bringing special operations medics, trauma surgeons, general surgeons, one EM doc, two anesthesiologists forward to help with the efforts in Ukraine uh, during this invasion. Uh, it's been a really good application of seeing how soft medics, this is what they were designed to do for, and it's bad that this is the only time that we can see them shine. Why does it take a global pandemic or another invasion of another country for us to start implementing and using some of these guys with this special skill set to the fullest of their ability? The last thing that I'll mention about Ukraine is we talked about what's going on previously with the wars on terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan and what the next war looks like. Uh, there's a bunch of different thoughts around what's going on in Ukraine, and if you're in this room, you're there should be some focus on what's going on in Ukraine, both on the medical and the tactical side, logistics and operational. And I would encourage you that if you've forgotten about the fact that there's a war going on in Ukraine with one of our highest adversaries, you should open your eyes to it and try to see what's going on and how you, where you're at and whatever your position is, can use what's going on there to help us here, both on the civilian and on the military side. This hospital here that I was working with has treated 13,000 casualties in the last six months. That is insane numbers. Insane numbers. Unfortunately, there's a lot that we can learn from, from the war in Ukraine with Russia from the US. And I'll leave you with this. It says it on the website, and somebody said it this morning. The MHSRS is the Department of Defense foremost scientific meeting. It provides a venue for presenting new scientific knowledge resulting from military unique research and development. The MSRHRS is the premier military or civilian meeting that focuses specifically on the unique medical needs of the warfighter. If you're here on behalf of a college, university, government organization, NGO, you're presenting a, a poster, presentation, or you are part of an abstract, raise your hand. Keep raising them. This is not about you. Put your hands down. This is not about you, and this is not about me. This is about the flag that you wear on your shoulder, the country that we live in, and getting us ready to support the warfighter during the next one. It's coming. There's a reason that there's that much space left on that wall. More names are going to go to it. It's the things that we do here, both private and military sector, that make differences in the US and abroad to save American lives on the battlefield and here in the States. This isn't about your publication record. It's not about your PhD thesis. It's not about another article that you're gonna write. It's about everybody but you, including me. Thank you.
I'll leave behind that I have time for questions or no. All right, thank you, Mr. Shuley. All right, our next speaker is well known to many in this room, Dr. John Holcomb. Dr. John Holcomb received his MD from the University of Arkansas Medical School in 1985 and entered the US Army that same year. He spent the next decade deployed with the Joint Special Operations Command. From 2002 to 2008, Colonel Holcomb served as the commander of the US Army Institute of Surgical Research and trauma consultant for the Army Surgeon General. Over the years, he has had multiple combat deployments. He is the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award in Trauma Resuscitation Science from the American Heart Association, the United States Special Operations Command Medal, and the Service Award from the American College of Surgery. He is a three-time recipient of the Army's Greatest Invention Award. He has been a member of the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care since 2001. Colonel Holcomb retired from active duty in 2008. In 2019, Dr. Holcomb joined the University of Alabama in Birmingham and serves as a professor of surgery. He also holds the title Professor of Surgery for the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Dr. Holcomb is actively involved in clinical medicine, education, research, and entrepreneurship. He has published over 690 peer-reviewed articles. It is my honor to present Dr. John Holcomb. Well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be back at MHSRS, uh, previously known as ATAC, which I think started in about 1994, the first time I came to that, with 200 people in the audience. What a, what a great change. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is what we do matters. And I think you've heard some of that before already in the previous speaker. I do have some disclosures. None of them have anything to do with what I'm going to talk about today. Next slide. So I'm going to tell a little story. That's what I like to do when I give talks. I like to tell stories. And we're going to weave together six themes, all of them you've heard in the, in the previous speakers this morning. And I'm going to do that probably in the next 25 minutes. It's not just whole blood. Although we're going to talk about whole blood, I want you to think about your intervention, infectious disease, public health, whatever your thing is, think about how these themes also apply to what you do. What we do really matters, not only for the military, but civilians here and around the world. We're gonna to weave together whole blood, as I said, as an example. First, we're gonna talk a little bit of history because history is really important. So Sam Carmichael, who's a civilian surgeon, a uh, young surgeon at Wake Forest, wrote this paper and really describes the history of blood as shock resuscitation. It didn't start last year or a couple years ago, actually in 1667 as a treatment of mental health illness with predictably poor results. I think it was a wife and a husband is this the real story there. Whole blood didn't become safe and therapeutic until the early 20th century, although it was used in the Civil War in the United States with the advent of reliable equipment, sterilization, and blood typing, all springing from our work in World War I. Colonel P. Churchill in the book, Surgeon to Soldiers, speaks to whole blood as a really a life-saving treatment that changed the course of combat casualties because at the beginning of World War II and through the majority of it actually, whole blood wasn't used, neither were red cells, plasma, dried plasma was a primary resuscitative fluid and many soldiers died pale from lack of red cells and oxygen delivery. P. Churchill changed that by implementing whole blood uh, in the latter part of the war. By the end of World War II, dried plasma and whole blood had been used in over 800,000 transfusions, and most importantly, in the pre-hospital area to include on the beaches of Anzio, as, as depicted in this picture. Tom Shires and James Carrico, real giants of resuscitation in the 60s and 70s, and had funding from, at that time, the Department of Defense and the federal government, started looking at animals and they used controlled resuscitation studies where they used a stopcock to bleed the animals off and on. And what they found was by giving crystalloid and a little bit of shed blood that those animals did really well. This paper was presented in 1963. In Vietnam, because at the beginning of Vietnam, whole blood was the primary resuscitation fluid as it was in Korea. But during that time, because of this work that was done with the controlled resuscitation animal models, 
they changed to crystalloid and components. And then this thing called Da Nang Lung started showing up, otherwise known as ARDS, not previously well described in the resuscitation of combat casualties in World War II or Korea. And then you kind of move forward from the, the mid 70s, 20 years, and Art Fleming, a retired colonel surgeon, and uh, along with his folks at, in Los Angeles, Bill Shoemaker, were giving 10 to 13 liters of crystalloid. Instead of the four to five that Shires talked about, now they had really used excessive crystalloid and were causing substantial complications. Next slide. So Blau now move forward another decade, describes this iatrogenic resuscitation injury. We're giving excessive chrysaloid, not what was described by Carrico and his, and his partners, but now excessive chrysaloid up to 20 liters of chrysaloid. This is where I came into place and, and, and uh, general place as well. We did this because we were taught to do this and we did it over and over and over again, thinking we were helping our patients. Zolt, published this paper in 2003 showing that this excessive chrysaloid caused intra-abdominal hypertension, abdominal compartment syndrome, multi-organ failure, and death. It was an iatrogenic injury from excessive chrysaloid. Next slide. So the animal research using controlled hemorrhage models led to many, many problems. Uh, and the problem really, as you kind of got, went back and unfolded this, was the animal models utilized were not the right animal models. Hindsight, of course, being 2020. Next slide. So the evolution of resuscitation, if you look at this history of resuscitation, and, and this is a US-centric slide, 1864 is the first documented use of whole blood that I can find, done by a Southern surgeon, who, by the way, became chairman of surgery and dean at the University of Arkansas, where I went to school. I uh, didn't know that at the time. And uh, anyway, whole blood and blood products were really used as the primary resuscitative fluid for 126 of the last 158 years. And as you can see in this timeline, the Vietnam era and early 2000s, we really got confused and gave a lot of crystalloid, not many red cells, very little plasma, and almost no platelets. That has come back, we've reversed that, and it comes from our experience in the war uh, as I'll talk about in just a minute, where now we're back to dried plasma and whole blood again. Pretty interesting, back to what was done in World War II. Next slide. So history. History is important. So whatever it is you are researching, right, re know that history. Know the history. It's extraordinarily important. We've all heard the phrase, history repeats itself. So those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Well, that's what happened in resuscitation uh, stories here. We, not, we must know the evolution of the issue, know why it happened, know the methods, read those methods of those papers and understand the science. Okay, next uh, theme here is experience. Next slide. So uh, in 1993, as a young surgeon right out of training and, and uh, Dr. Rouse showed a slide from the Black Hawk Down movie, uh, which is pretty close to what happened on the battlefield. I found myself as a young surgeon taking care of combat casualties, clearly for the first time. I graduated surgery residency in 91. Um, and in the middle of this mass cow, Colonel Denver Perkins, who had a, a vast experience in Vietnam as an infantry soldier and was the colonel who was the head of anesthesia in our combat support hospital, in the midst of the mass cow, we're running out of blood products. Patients are still coming in. He said, why don't we do a whole blood drive? Well, I had never heard of whole blood. I'd never heard of a whole blood. Nobody ever said a word about whole blood. I thought we were gonna go to jail if we lived through this episode, I, truly. But we were running out of blood products. Denver was the colonel. I was a young major. We gave units of whole blood that were warm from the donor. You didn't need to put it through a blood warmer to hang them, hang them on the patients. And the coagulopathic bleeding stopped. It was an amazing experience. At this, uh, at this, not this venue, but in the ATAC meeting in 1994, I described it as a religious experience as a clinician. Probably not the right way to describe something in an academic forum. So you then move forward another decade or so, and we started writing about these things from the previous war and the current war, writing about damage control resuscitation, Phil Spinella, really grabbed hold of this out of the 31st CASH database and talk, started writing about risk associated with fresh whole blood compared to red blood cell transfusion. And they evened themselves out. And then warm fresh whole blood is, was independently associated with improved survival in patients with combat injuries. Really documenting now this experience, the growing experience in the war. Next slide. 
And then move forward another decade to tactical combat casualty care. And Frank Butler writes, for tactical combat casualty care for pre-hospital care in 2014, whole blood is the primary recommended fluid. A pretty bold statement at the time in 2014, but one that I think has been uh, proven uh, true. Jeremy Cannon, who's in the audience, uh, wrote a really influential paper from the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma Guidelines talking about balanced resuscitation. Think back to that timeline before when we gave lots of crystalloid, very little red cells, plasma platelets, and now our, one of our major uh, trauma associations with Jeremy Cannon as first authors writing about balanced resuscitation is the way to go. And then the joint trauma system, CPGs, clinical practice guidelines, and we'll talk about the joint trauma system here in just a second, but the damage control resuscitation, whole blood, blood product resuscitation was the first guideline written in 2004, has been continuously updated as recently as 2019, is really helping to, to drive the adoption of these practices. Next slide. So experience on the battlefield, no substitute for deployment experience. Now, when you don't have a war, it's hard to deploy to war, right? But there are wars going on all the time, and our military healthcare system deploys all over the place all the time. Leaders must deploy. Deployed patient care is critical. It's different than garrison care. I've done lots of garrison care, continue to do it today. I work in a large university setting. The care and the way we do it on the battlefield for our injured soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines is different than taking care of the garrison care back here in the rear. We learn the problems of the battlefield, we learn the potential solutions, and then we bring those back and iteratively work on them over and over and over again, share them with our colleagues who don't deploy, and then we deploy again and again and again. This is what makes us different. This is what makes us different. We have to deploy, leaders must do it. It makes military medicine different from garrison care and everything else that's done in medicine. Research. So General Peak, at that time, the Surgeon General asked me to assume command of the Institute of Surgical Research in 2002, and I had the, the great honor of, of uh, helping to lead that organization for six years. We did hundreds of animal studies, literally hundreds. We had animals going up and down all day long all different kind of animal studies going on. We did very little randomized human research. And when people, when you look back at your jobs, and I've done this in here, the error that I made as commander of the ISR was not pushing more clinical research, high quality clinical research. I wish I'd done that. We did a lot of work. Jill Sandin led a lot of these efforts with Mike Dubik, Charlie Wade, a whole group of really talented researchers. and. What I would say that was really fun there was combining clinicians with basic science, translational science research uh, experts, and forming these multidisciplinary teams, as Dr. Woodson said earlier, that really brings together everybody's expertise to solve problems. Jill wrote about blood pressure, which where bleeding occurs, and found the same thing in the animals uh, that was found in uh, World War I and World War II, and then went on to talk about the uncontrolled hemorrhage models are different. They're fundamentally different than controlled hemorrhage models and published that in shock, going back to those Carrico and Shire studies. And then as you progress on uh, through, the, through that decade, she wrote about using different combinations of blood products compared to crystalloid, and which one do you think was better? It was whole blood. When you did it in a prospective randomized animal study, whole blood was the superior product. Next slide. We deployed research teams out of the Institute of Surgical Research in combination with the Joint Trauma System. We established, Laura Broche is in the audience, was really the driving force establishing for the first time a human research program, protection program, in a combatant command. This paper documents how to do that. That, that a human HRP is no longer in place, as, as I understand, but this paper describes exactly how to do that. And then Jeremy Perkins, who's not here because he's working back at Walter Reed, talked about these research teams and what they did, how to form them, how to deploy them, how many deployed, and the, uh, and the lessons learned from a research point of view on the battlefield. Extremely important that we continue to put research teams on the battlefield. So why, do these, why is research so important? This is a little graphic um, that from the Institute of Medicine in 2013, and, and while the graphic doesn't speak to trauma systems, I added that tile at the top, 
And the real point of this, despite all the words, is in a learning healthcare system, research influences practice and practice influences research. They go hand in hand. You cannot have a high quality learning system without a very active, robust research program that informs practice and vice versa. Now, coming back to trauma, and this is a slide I've used many times, if you're gonna improve outcomes in a trauma system, you have to work across the entire continuum of care, both from simulation, injury prevention, pre-hospital pain control, all the way through the things that we often talk about, stopping bleeding, transfusion, to rehab and outcomes. That entire continuum of care needs to be optimized in every one of those areas. And then the, the, the sum of those individual parts actually is much greater than the individual parts. Next slide. Peter Ree wrote a paper entitled Increasing Trauma Deaths in the United States and published in Annals of Surgery in 2014. But in that paper, uh, talks about the funding so to do have research and have a robust research program, and everybody on the front row knows this, you have to have a, uh, funding. At the federal level, trauma funding is woefully un unappreciated and not supported. They, um, you have cancer and heart disease, HIV, and trauma is obviously the small little thing down there in the bottom right of your screen. But it, it, if, you look at, if you look at the societal impact, the trauma funding is nowhere uh, in relation to the societal impact. The trauma is the leading cause of death of one to 44 in the United States. Most of the people in this room are in the one to 44 range, right? The old folks in the room are in the cancer and heart disease range. And I always say, now who makes all the decisions? Well, it's probably the old folks, and that's, where, that's why they're funding cancer and heart disease. But for the young folks, and for the guys who go down range, they would look at that and go, wait a minute, I'm not gonna get cancer and heart disease down range, I might get injured, right? Let's fund the injury. It, it kind of makes sense. What do most funders fund? This is a, you know, when I went to the university, once I got out of the army, I started looking around and, and, and running a research organization, multidisciplinary research organization and a, and, a, and a division and a really busy academic center. Most funders fund preclinical research, basic science and preclinical research. So what do research labs do? They do preclinical and, and basic science research, very little clinical. What should we fund? What should we fund? I think we need to reverse those circles and fund more clinical work and less preclinical work. That is not disparaging preclinical work. It's just we've got to have a balance between those two. And in my opinion, they're not balanced. So in the, in the bleeding world, we talk about the bloody vicious cycle, which is coagulopathy and bleeding and all that kind of thing. But this is a research site and it's data, right? I love data, by the way, if you haven't figured that out. I'm like this data geek guy as a trauma surgeon. So consistent federal funding is not commensurate with societal impact. It's not. It's been well published and well documented. So therefore, few investigators go into real injury research because it's like that bank and money thing. The money's not there. Because the investigators aren't interested in an injury because there's no funding, you lack high quality data. Low quality data gets published in low impact journals. And that, in my opinion, drives tradition driven suboptimal clinical care. Once we have, if we have high quality papers, people kind of follow that, they really do. The clinicians try to follow high quality data, but it's just, it's really a sad, vicious cycle in my opinion. Next slide. Now there are hundreds of non-randomized whole blood papers right now. When you go to folks who are not believers, who haven't had the religious experience, they go, well, this paper is, you know, it's, it's retrospective, it's single center, it's that, this and that. There are two randomized studies so far, both funded uh, actually by the DOD. Both pilot studies, both small single centers, one by Brian Cotton in 2013, and then a decade later, uh, the folks out of Pittsburgh, Frank Guyette, published their pre-hospital whole blood study. Now, there are two large definitive randomized whole blood trials, both DOD and NIH funded, that have been funded. Uh, the paperwork is getting sorted out. They're going to they're start any day now. The troop study, PI on Janssen in Alabama, 1,100 patients at 12 centers is an in-hospital study. And the Lights Tower study, PI Jason Sperry, almost 1,100 patients at 10 centers is a pre-hospital study. Both have mortality as a primary endpoint. So in another couple years, these two large funded prospective randomized studies will come to fruition and we'll have data in both places. So 
the DOD, in my opinion, should fund more clinical research. We need to deploy research teams to the battlefield under the auspices of the Joint Trauma System. Uh, every trauma system must have a research arm, must have research capability, and that's where it should, should come out of. We need to sustain these multi-year programs of clinical research like LIGHTS. Uh, just keep them going, do one study right after the other. The infrastructure required to put these programs together is substantial and needs to be sustained. <clears throat> and we just need to do this clinical research that translates to the battlefield and the civilian area. It makes findings sticky, uh, especially during the interwar period. We do these large clinical studies, we find out something that works, you implement them in the civilian world and in our MTFs, and then the results are sticky when we go back to war. Next slide. Dissemination, implementation, and policy. Yeah, you, some of my friends on the front row are going, Holcomb is talking about policy. How about that? The Joint Trauma System, first described in its nascent form in 2003, has three components on their website. I'm suggesting, as I said already, research should be the fourth component and, and, and supports three committees that really cover uh, the majority of what goes on the battlefield from pre-hospital care, in-route care, and then in the operating rooms as well. The whole blood, as I said before, was the first clinical practice guideline. It's been continuously revived, uh, revised and improved based upon data from the war, both for the performance improvement efforts from the registry and from research efforts describing improved outcomes. And just, just to reiterate, uh, in 2014, actually, what is it, eight years ago, pre-hospital blood was recommended as a primary fluid of choice, the number one fluid. A lot of logistics tail to that, and a lot of catching up had to be done. Next slide. So military and civilian adoption, which is in, in critically important to making changes that happen on the battlefield stick in the civilian world. So as we do our MIL-CIV teams and, and all of our military reserve and civilian folks learn how to utilize these innovations, um, that from a whole blood point of view, Colonel Taylor wrote the, and described the blood program from 2014 into 2021. And during this paper, describes the change where whole blood was almost universally walking blood bank whole blood to low titer whole blood, tested and approved, FDA cleared, uh, et cetera. Really an important and huge transformation in the use of whole blood on the battlefield. One of the questions that is interesting and we're trying to, and others are trying to tease out of the data, is low titer whole blood as efficacious from an outcome point of view as the walking blood bank whole blood? It may not be, it might, it's a research question. And then uh, the folks in San Antonio, and I know there's a number of them in the room, have really described their implementation of whole blood in the civilian setting. They've done a better job than any place that I know of with both pre-hospital, in the hospital, multiple hospitals, multiple trauma centers, uh, reacting to everyday trauma and also mass casualties. A really uh, lovely implementation of whole blood across their entire trauma system. Next slide. Colonel Gurney is in the audience, writes about whole blood at the tip of the spear, uh, documenting the experience on the battlefield and the improved outcomes. And then Stacy Shackford, Colonel Shackford is in the audience as well, writes this real kind of a, almost a policy statement, if you're not policy, but a statement, consensus statement from the Joint Trauma System, the Defense Committee on Trauma, and the Armed Services Blood Program on whole blood. Pretty important statement from these three very influential groups. And then Phil Spinella and Andy Cap, both in the audience, write on this paper uh, published now six years ago, six or seven different ways whole blood is better than components. Extremely logical paper and one that I really, really like and, and hand out to everybody. Really an excellent summary of the benefits going all the way from economics, logistics, uh, to of course, uh, clinical outcomes. And then that policy statement, you know, coming in 2022, the DODI talking about, it's not exclusively on whole blood, it's on the Armed Services blood, blood Program, but also speaking to whole blood, walking blood bank and low titer all whole blood. On the civilian side, right, which is where a lot of care happens, a lot of our military folks train on the civilian side, certainly the reservists work in civilian hospitals. Up, this is data from 2020, so a little dated, uh, published last year in transfusion, 24.5%, 25% 
of civilian level one and two trauma centers currently use whole blood. So that's two year old data. It's gotta be 35% now. So I would just say around a third of US hospitals likely, you, uh, level one and two trauma centers, a third are using whole blood in the hospital, in the ED, in their ORs. But by combining NEMSIS data, which is the pre-hospital data, not linked to in-hospital data, by the way, right? So there's no linkage of pre-hospital and hospital data yet. Only 0.5% of eligible pre-hospital patients received any blood product. So the standard of care from 2014 in the military recommendation is almost never used in the civilian population uh, from data from two years ago. Next slide. It is the standard of care, as I said, in the deployed setting. It's not universally done, but it is the standard that we teach to, rarely done in civilian pre-hospital setting, although there are absolutely uh, exceptions to that. I think the reason there's not more pre-hospital uh, blood is because the pre-hospital providers can't bill for it. Therefore, they can't use it because they can't put something on the rigs, both air and ground, that they can't bill for because they can't lose money. That to me needs a change. I don't know if that's a law or regulatory change, or law, but just think about this. There are actually prospective randomized data, not shown in this talk, that pre-hospital blood decreases uh, uh, death by 10%, both military and civilian, yet because the civilian medics can't bill, those systems can't bill for it, you can't have uh, pre-hospital blood in hardly any place. That needs a change. Next slide. So dissemination, implementation, and policy. I, you know, I think these, the, when you look at the CPGs on the JTS website, they're clearly focused on the deployed setting. And yet a lot of them apply into our MTFs. It's my opinion they should be implemented as they can be at our, at our MTF so that we train all of those people on all of those concepts all the time. It should be taught at all professional military courses. TC3 should be a requirement for all, mili all military personnel, not just uh, medical. And the policy shouldn't take 20 years to promulgate on this, on this uh, product. Training. Next slide. So these MILSIV partnerships, I didn't put the, another slide up because I have to compress this a little bit, but MILSIV partnerships have been described since World War I. There's actually books written about it during that era, going back to that history lesson earlier. Marty Schreiber, who's in the audience, wrote a paper in 2002 from our experience at Ben Taub talking about military trauma team training, you know, in a civilian institution. And then Colonel Gurney, again, writes about team training uh, in this year. Single surgeon teams, multidisciplinary, rotated, assigned, all these issues have been going around, but the idea is that we want our teams before they deploy to have taken care of trauma patients before they go downrange. And you just ask the question, are, selected, are the selected MILSIV sites using whole blood? Are they using whole blood? You're gonna see it downrange, both pre-hospital and the hospital, are they using it at the MILSIV sites? Next slide. So I tried to generate some data. Nine of 52 of our military MTFs have whole blood. They're listed here, nine of 52. In the MILSIV hospitals, there's 87 MILSIV kind of team sites. The number is a little bit flexible. How many have whole blood? I couldn't get that answer. It's not really hard. It's kind of hard to get that number. At level one and two trauma centers, civilian centers, this is not MILSIV or military, 25% or 123 two years ago used whole blood. And then in our, in our military healthcare system back here in Garrison, where is whole blood pre-hospital? Where is it, right? Remember, I saw whole blood for the first time in 1993 in Somalia, and I had never heard of it. I thought we were gonna to go to jail. I had no idea how it was gonna work. There was nothing I had read about it before. We shouldn't repeat that again for the, for the guys and gals that are going down range, both pre-hospital and hospital. Where do our teams learn about whole blood, right? I just kind of made that point, I think. We shouldn't see it for the first time on the battlefield. Next slide. Training. We need to train as close as possible to how we fight. Um, currency in all aspects of trauma care is critical to success on the battlefield. Systems, registry, PI, research, the entire team, medics to administrators can't see whole blood for the first time in combat. Next slide. Worldwide impact, next. So whole blood is now included on the research agenda for trauma critical care. This is an international publication that came out a couple years ago. People around the world are talking about whole blood now and how to implement it and how to do it. Next slide. 
In the UK, I've already mentioned the two previous US studies. The UK is doing a similar study of 848 patients, 10 sites, primary endpoint, 24-hour mortality with, uh, pre with whole blood and starting in the pre-hospital arena. Next slide. And the French are doing a similar study, albeit smaller, 164 patients whose primary endpoint is coagulopathy. Next slide. So much like the previous speaker said, Ukraine is a pretty interesting place to go to. My, my first trip in April of this year talked about whole blood, as you might expect, uh, talked about the benefits of whole blood. Whole blood was being used in Ukraine, but a little bit under the, uh, under the radar, if you will, because the federal authority had not authorized the use of whole blood. Next slide. Two weeks after working with some folks in Western Ukraine, and their hospital that was receiving casualties, not right off the battlefield, but uh, days later, whole blood was new and it was in the refrigerator in the emergency department. Next slide. And then two months after this, through a lot of work by a lot of people, the Ukraine Defense Ministry of Health uh, decreed at the Minister of Health in their civilian hospitals that whole blood could be used pre-hospital, in the hospital, and essentially took all of the JTS guidelines and implemented them. TXA, one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, walking blood bank when you read this uh, document. Next slide. So there is worldwide impact. People are using whole blood around the world. Uh, in many centers in the United States, 50% of the whole blood is for non-trauma patients, actually, maternal fetal bleeding, postpartum bleeding. And it just, just proves this thing that we know over and over and over again, that innovations from the war move into the civilian space and become a standard of care. On PubMed, if you put whole blood and military, from 1994 to 2000, you can see this exponential increase in papers published uh, about whole blood. Next slide. So in summary, <clears throat> whole blood was used for the first time that we know of in 1993 for US combat casualties. The DOD and NOH funded a program of blood research and has changed clinical practice really around the world. How will we ensure our clinical teams utilize this practice before deploying? They have to use it here in the rear. It's really hard to see something for the first time downrange. And what we do matters. The research, the funding, policy, clinically, and keep that laser focus on improving outcomes on the battlefield. Next slide. Now, this is uh, Don Quixote, right? It was one of my favorite books ever. And Don Quixote kind of challenged authority. And I say this with all due respect to the general officer sitting around right here in front of me. But challenging dogma and authority respectfully and with data uh, is the way to go, it is admittedly upsetting to the status quo, but it's the only way progress is made, especially during the interwar period. We've got to be ready for the next war. Next slide. So it's not just whole blood. This is an exemplar of many, many other things. Uh, it's just a vehicle to describe that what we do matters, not only for the military and civilians, but here and around the world. You all should be very proud of what you do. You really should, you know, pat each other on the back, pat each, yourself on the back a little bit. There's a lot of people that are trying to bring you down, but a lot of what you all do is so extraordinarily important and it makes a difference on the battlefield. Next slide. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Holcomb. Our next two distinguished speakers are from the Robotics Institute, Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Arturo Dubrowski is the Alumni Research Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, where he directs the Autumn Lab, one of the largest academic research groups focusing on artificial intelligence and its real-world applications. He has been pushing the boundaries of science and transitioning results of his research to industry and government practice for more than three decades. In addition, Dr. Dabrowski has led development of machine learning solutions to extract clinically useful information from streams of complex biosignals and applying the resulting tools in clinical and field case scenarios. Dr. Howie Chassett is a professor of robotics at Carnegie Mellon University, where he serves as the co-director of the Biorobotics Lab. His research program has made contributions to challenging and strategically significant problems in diverse areas such as surgery, manufacturing, infrastructure inspection, and search and rescue. He leads multiple PI projects centered on manufacturing and co-led the formation of the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute, a $250 million national institute advancing both technology development and education for robotics and manufacturing. Recently, Dr. Chassette's surgical snake robot cleared the FDA and has been in use in the United States and Europe. 
Dr. Josette received his undergraduate degrees in computer science and business from the University of Pennsylvania and his master's and PhD from Caltech. In 2002, the MIT Technology Review elected Dr. Josette as one of its top 100 innovators in the world under 35. In 2014, Popular Science selected Dr. Chosette's medical robotics work as the best of what's new in healthcare. Dr. Dubrowski and Dr. Chosette, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Howie Chosette, this is Arthur Dubrowski, and we're gonna tag team our, our, our conversation today. So uh, I, I want to thank uh, Jose Salinas, Dr. Salinas, for inviting Archer and me to this, uh, uh, to this conference and for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, without him, you know, we wouldn't be here right now, so, so thank you. But before we go on, I also uh, want to express some gratitude. Um, I want to express some gratitude for those of you who uh, sacrificed and serve our country. You know, Jose asked us to speak about you know, the future of robotics, we're in our ivy tower, isolated from the real world, and you're out there, you know, serving our country so we can do our jobs. So, so please, thank you. I also want to express another thought about Luke. So Luke works with us, and when the Taliban went into Afghanistan, Luke, I don't think he even blinked his eyes before he said he, he was going to go and try and help his friends. And it's amazing how he just continues to want to serve us, despite all the things that happened. He went to the Ukraine to serve as a medic, again, to support you know, our freedom without even hesitating once, without a bitter thought uh, from the past. So uh, again, I want to express our, at least our gratitude uh, for that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So what, Jose, what, what Dr. Salinas asked us to do was sort of dream a little bit about what's the future. And I'm not sure if we're really qualified to say what would be next, but at least I can tell you our, our aspirations. And what we want to do is we want to bring medical care everywhere at any time and can be performed by anyone. That is the long-term goal. We want to democratize medical care so expert, expert care can be delivered anywhere without a moment's notice. Now, next slide. Now, I think... We're seeing this already with the advent of minimally invasive surgery. I think we all understand that no one wants surgery, but if you have to have it, you're better off having the thing on the right than the thing on the left. Next slide. So the benefits of minimally invasive surgery, uh, it's, it's less pain, uh, you also have reduced costs, and then finally, you can bring medical care anywhere. We're hoping to not only bring it out of centers of, of medical excellence, like the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, but we also want to be able to bring it into the office, into the field. Can we do an appendectomy in the field with one of our uh, field technicians instead of having to airlift an injured warfighter to, uh, say, India or Germany in order to receive the proper care that he needs? Next slide. So with, with minimally invasive surgery, if you sort of look at how deep you can go into the body and how uh, uh, the kinds of spaces that you may want to see, next slide. This is where all the current procedures are. And you'll see there's this, next slide, there's this open for going deep into the body and be able to navigate the intracavity spaces. There isn't technology that does that yet. And next slide. And that's where a lot of research and development in the academic world has been centered. And we're starting to see some of this with, with some medical device companies as well, like Intuitive Surgical, for example. So it's that cavity, that's where the opportunity is. But, the next slide. But if you look at conventional minimally invasive surgical devices today, you're limited to rigid, uh, okay. You're, rigid to, you're limited to rigid laparoscopes that can only enter a line of sight or you have, buckle, you have flexible endoscopes which can travel the luminal spaces, but they buckle easily. What you want is a, it's almost like a snake or a steerable laparoscope, a surgical snake robot like you see on the right-hand side that can go through the intracavity spaces as easily as driving a colonoscope. And that's where some of our work is going. So if you go to the next slide. So what you see here 
is the first in human operation with this surgical snake robot. We're doing an epicardial mapping and then an ablation of this 75 kilogram woman. And what you see on the right is the live fluoroscopy of the snake robot going around her heart. And then in the upper left, you see the visualization from the catheter, the visualization catheter, uh, seeing what the uh, physician, hit, hit the space bar again. One more time. What you're seeing is not a surgeon performing this procedure. You're seeing a specialist. This is someone who didn't have the same level of training that, that a surgeon has. So we're starting to see this progression from surgeon to non-surgeon. And when we do this, we're eventually going to have tools that will have perhaps non-doctors, non-medical uh, field techs be able to perform these kinds of procedures. So next slide. So the, oh, let's go to the next slide. Let's just skip that. We can skip that. Clear the FDA. Good. Next slide. So where uh, I'm getting excited about is this fad that, that came about about 10 years ago and has since died off, but I want to bring it back, called natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. And the idea is you enter through a natural orifice, breach the luminal space, and then go after the, the target that you want to fix, like the pancreas, for example, this type of the pancreas. You, can, you know, what's the phrase? You know, God created the pancreas so surgeons can send their kids to college. It, now what we want to be able to do is reach this in a minimally invasive way and the person can then go home uh, and have spicy food the next day perhaps. But the reason why this brings us out to the field is now you don't need a sterile operating field anymore. You can start to do procedures in a more, I don't want to say dirty, but less clean environment and still have the same efficacy and at the same time hurt the patient a lot less. So we actually started this. Next slide. So I know what you're thinking. When you woke up this morning, you weren't going to see two snake robots shoved up a pig's ass. Um, I get that a lot. But what you're seeing here is two of our snake robots going in and removing this pig's pancreas. And it's doing it in, in a way where the pig only had this, big, this much of an incision inside itself, inside its large intestine. Next slide. And that's a close-up. And, the, he, and these are the benefits or the research, excuse me, these are the areas that we're currently doing our research on. Next slide. So the next thing I want to do in order to have portability is talk about ultrasound. So I think we all agree that no one likes looking at ultrasound images unless it's a baby and it's yours. Okay. Otherwise, when you're looking at ultrasound images, it's just impossible to discern. It's hard. So Arthur and I, along with our colleague John Galliotti, what we're doing is, is we're creating new uh, techniques to enable surgeons, non-surgeons, uh, field medics to be able to inspect and see what's going on just using ultrasound information. And if we can do that, think of the benefit. It's portable, it's low cost, and also it doesn't uh, affect the patient that much. And this work is part of our project. Next slide that we're doing with the University of Pittsburgh, Ron Porapartich, whose name I never pronounced correctly, uh, he's the leader of this project, and we've been very fortunate uh, to have him bring the, the, the University of Pittsburgh doctors together with the Carnegie Mellon uh, robotics researchers, and we're creating these tools that will allow someone like me, or maybe slightly more competent, to be able to insert lines, say, into your femoral vein in the field using ultrasound to guide the search. And there's a lot of details here I'm happy to talk about, but what we're excited about is being able to deliver that kind of care out uh, where people you know, shouldn't be getting that kind of care. Next slide. Um, so I want to change subjects again and talk a little bit more about um, one of the uh, another ways we can get accessibility. So during the uh, great ventilator shortage rumor of, of the pandemic, uh, we at Carnegie Mellon designed and built a new low-cost ventilator using parts that are readily sourced that would be about the same functionality, sorry, 80% of the functionality of a hospital ventilator, but the cost and convenience and portability of those manual ventilators that Luke was talking about, the ones you have to squeeze. So, so we were happy about this ventilator, but the part that the, the doctors really liked uh, I thought it would be pretty cool having a low-cost ventilator because then people can go home and be able to get treatment without going to the hospital. But the part they liked, let's go to the next slide, was that this ventilator talked to the cloud very easily. So now you can actually control, monitor, uh, and perhaps give advice 
anywhere in the world to any of these ventilators. And what's exciting here is not only can we have this portability, this ability to disseminate the care, but we can now start tracking the data. We can now start figuring out are there phenomena occurring en masse and be able to make better predictions as to what's, uh, where the disease may be going, where it's going next. Now, I realize we have NetSyn, that, that, that network protocol. The part that we're interested in, Archer and I, in our research, is what is the information that you're going to put on that protocol that would be relevant for the doctors to talk, uh, to process. I think, how am I doing for time? I forgot what time. OK. So uh, I have one more thing I want to present. Let's go to the next slide. And this is what we call expeditionary robotics. And again, our goal is to bring medical care out as quickly as possible anywhere. And what we saw, so Luke, one of the things he did when he volunteered during the pandemic was uh, he went to Columbia University in New York and he helped, uh, uh, um, help, helped with, the, with, the, um, with the doctors there. And he uh, actually took a video of them setting up a field hospital on the, uh, on the um, soccer field at Columbia University. It took three days to set up that field hospital. And it was three days of really strong and smart people trying to figure out where to put what where as quickly as possible. What we want to do is we want to create tools to help automate that process. So we're re-envisioning how to deploy these kinds of field hospitals. Next slide. So the reason why you, oh, that's the Columbia slide I'd forgotten about. Um, I already said this stuff, so just th that's the, the picture from Columbia. Next slide. So in our vision is we have UAVs go out, survey an area. Next slide. We then have containers uh, dr driven by trucks to the remote location. These containers are specially designed for, for medical use. They're deployed, next slide. And then they're assembled into a hospital. Now they can be assembled using forklifts that people drive, or we can have auto additional autonomous robots uh, going around helping, people as, helping the people as well assemble these structures. Next slide. And here's some of our uh, concepts as, as to what these containers should look like. You know, in a sense, what we want to be able to do is build a hospital as if we're putting Lego together using as few tools as possible. And that's important because when we go and deploy these hospitals, it's not like if you forget something, you can go to Home Depot uh, and, and pick it up. We, we, we may be in austere environments, and again, time is of the essence. Uh, next slide. And it's just another picture of what we had in mind. Next slide. So these are the uh, ideas, at least, that, that um, we're starting to think about in, in, on the robotic side of things. And, you know, robotics, the, the actual, you know, if you want to think of Archer and me as I'm the brawn and he's the brains, if you want to think of that way, so go to the next slide. And that's where the artificial intelligence more comes in. I spoke about the robotics and Archer will take over and talk about the AI aspect of our work. Please. Thank you very much, Howie. Uh... You know how some uh, physicians, maybe in some specialties, such, such as psychology or maybe psychiatry, choose to study that field because they may be lacking something? That's also my mode of operation. I work on artificial intelligence, guess why? <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you very much. I just missed the beginning of the presentation uh, by Luke Shuley, and I don't know if he mentioned that his role in special operations was of combat medic. And you heard that we work on automating Luke Shuley. And now you know why. Because he's not in service anymore. So we need to replace him. We need to scale his capabilities as well as many of his um, peers so that we can treat more people in need, not just in the military, but also in civilian situations involving traffic accidents and such. So this is an important technology that requires not only strong clinical and field care expertise, but also robotics, and luckily for me, artificial intelligence, so that it all can work together. Uh, one more thing before we switch to the next slide is um, I may look young, but I'm not. I started working in the field of AI almost to the day 32 years ago. And by the time when I was joining this field as a young researcher, I thought that I may be late to the chase. Because I, I watched all the science fiction movies, seeing robots roaming around and doing wonderful things, and smart systems making decisions for humans and whatnot. 
Luckily, I was wrong. Fast forward 32 years, and where we are? My goal, just like Howie's, is to make sure that everyone uses my tools everywhere at all times. You can check what is the penetration in healthcare of AI solutions. Everybody is talking about it, but how many successful deployments did we see? So in my part of the talk, I'll try to expose a few limits, few roadblocks that prevent us from achieving that final goal, and hint you on some ways that we on our side think about overcoming them. Of course, the list of these roadblocks will be incomplete. Next slide, please. So we have actually a few uh, examples of great potential of applying artificial intelligence to, to various aspects of healthcare. The first one is actually I'm, I'm going to only focus on things that I participated in so that I don't mislead people uh, when I explain them. Um, is an example of a discovery made with AI. We applied AI to uh, a bunch of data collected at the bedside settings in intensive care with the idea of predict uh, episodes of uh, cardiorespiratory insufficiency. So all sorts of waveform vital signs were involved and such. And we build those predictors. And then we discovered that these predictors do not seem to follow the principle of, of one size fits all. So we su suspected some heterogeneity of the patient population. And indeed, what this graph shows is our discovery. Horizontal axis in this graph is time, not yet, uh, is time. Vertical axis is a relative risk for developing cardiorespiratory insufficiency, CRI episode. You see that some of the patients follow the yellow line. That they are always at high risk. They are very unlikely to be missed by healthcare professionals who are watching them in ICUs. So they are not really in trouble of being missed. But about two-thirds of these patients, green, blue, and, and red lines, follow very different trajectory. They escalate rather rapidly only about a half an hour before the episode, before the onset. So we were worried about those. So that's interesting discovery. We didn't know that this heterogeneous structure existed unless until we applied the AI. The next one, very quickly, is an example of already fairly mature project that uh, looks at emerging epidemies of hospital-acquired infections in hospitals, in facilities. But they should apply almost without any changes those solutions to Navy ships, um, um, military installations, and such. Um, apparently, hospital-acquired infections are responsible for more deaths in the U.S. every year than prostate and breast cancers combined. I didn't know the magnitude of this problem. So we have the system that uses AI, whole genome sequencing, electronic health records, not only detect the emerging outbreaks very early, but also to probabilistically assess the most likely pathways of transmission of the bug between individuals. So this gives uh, um, infection control teams strong weapon to counter those events. Next one. And this is perhaps the most related to the theme of this conference, and the details of this work will be presented in more, uh, in more uh, detail uh, tomorrow in the morning oral session. Uh, this is about uh, monitoring sufficiency of resuscitation uh, using only non-invasive vital signs, so with the eye to deploy it in the field medicine. Um, the idea here is to not only discover where the patient should be put under aggressive fluid resuscitation, but when to stop that aggressive protocol, because we don't, know, we don't want to overshoot. Next slide. So I come from Carnegie Mellon University. We think that we know a little bit about artificial intelligence. And at some point, somebody decided that we need to put this knowledge into some sort of systematic view. And this is the diagram that you're going to see when you come to visit us and you speak with anyone about anything related to AI. This is a must. This is called AI stack of capabilities. And it's not very um, um, revealing, except that it assume, uh, accumulates all the layers of different components that need to be present and implemented and made to work together for anyone who wants their AI systems to be successful in practice. So you cannot ignore any of those layers. Next slide, please. Coincidentally, when you think about uh, applying uh, AI in practice, but any other technology in practice, you need to think about also project maturity, project cycles. So um, we have data capturing, we have data assembly and curation, we have data making data ready for AI. These are the necessary steps. Without completing them, we cannot expect that our modeling endeavors uh, will be successful. 
So if you, if you are from academia and you work in the area of machine learning or AI, you typically focus on the green little arrow, modeling and summarization of data, because this is where most of research fund is, right? Uh, very few of us academicians venture to the left or to the right of that green arrow in the bottom. To the right is very important. If we develop a solution that works and we can prove it in, um, in, 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 in the lab, then it would be natural to move ahead and deploy it, but there are so many challenges there. Most of the applications of AI that make any sense to humans are important. And, and, and usually those fields of application have already developed culture, uh, standard solutions, and, and, and the whole processes around. And healthcare is one of those examples, right? We have pretty strong practice, uh, rules of practice, of care, and, and, and other things that are already there. And now an AI guy shows up with this black box solution and, and tells you, the clinicians, to please start using this instead of everything else that you've been using so far. How is that going to work? <laughs> You're going to be very, very skeptical about all this, right? So, um, so that's one of the, one of the uh, issues that slow us down in this idealistically speaking massive deployment of this good technology to, to practice. And then integration, how to integrate those things so that they don't disrupt good existing processes, but instead enhance them. It's not a trivial task. So if you want to look at this comprehensively, you have these two dimensions, the, the different capabilities and the different stages of, of maturity of your projects. And next slide. That creates a grid, uh, the grid of capabilities. And next slide uh, is very busy. I'm not going to read through all these boxes, obviously. But basically, uh, you can think of them as a mix of existing capabilities and capability gaps. There are plenty gaps in this picture. And uh, the AI research community is working hard on filling them in. Um, and I'm going to uh, now talk about uh, the key limitations that uh, are selected or extracted from this complicated grid, only a few of them uh, to focus our attention. Next slide, please. So what are the key, key limitations? We are going to talk next, but where they are coming from, they're usually caused by data and by the models. So you can, if, if you see that AI doesn't work, you can blame either or, or both, typically. Uh, next slide. So one big challenge is that our current AI models, they are very hungry for training data. They typically want to, to be fed with lots of examples of, of uh, healthcare records that reflect health and other examples that reflect illness. So, um, so we need to collect this data to train those models. Of course, this process is not cheap, it's not easy. It's mundane, it's cumbersome, and what's worse, we need to put many of you, uh, doctors and nurses, on the rear ends and ask them to sit down and point by point label big amounts of data to train those data-hungry models. So this is one of the uh, aspects of this whole process that prevent us from achieving what we want everywhere at all times, everywhere, e everyone, right? So we have some, uh, some tricks in our sleeves. Uh, one of them uh, goes under the code, ma code name of semi-supervised learning. It's nice because you only need some training data a little bit. And, uh, and uh, then hopefully you have a lot of data that is not actually labeled by any, any human expert sitting around. Electronic health records, bedside monitoring data are examples of, of these situations. So if you have some initial amount of data, you see a plot of this data, a scatter plot of this data on some, on some projection of the feature space, you may see something like this. Red, unhealthy people, blue uh, dots, healthy people. Next slide. And so if you wanted to apply you know, common sense, you may, you may see an opportunity to draw a line that separates these two groups of data, and you would achieve perfect classification, and this line may look like this. So if, you, if all that you had was this, was this data, maybe that was a good solution. But then, next slide, we may see that, that there is a bunch of unlabeled data that comes together with some of this labeled data. And when you see this, this distribution, you may, you may actually think that we should probably change our opinion of how this line should be plotted. Next slide. And it may look like this, right? 
So this is the essence of one of the tricks in our sleeve, semi-supervised learning, which can reduce the need for manually annotated data. Next slide. And how we do it is probably less important. Next slide. Uh, but what's important is this approach does not require any additional effort from human data annotators as soon as you have this initial sample uh, of labeled data. So that's very cheap in terms of human effort. Next slide. Um, still on the same challenge, uh, another idea that has been popular for the past couple of decades is called active learning. Here, the system is introverted and introspects its own inabilities or lack of uh, confidence and picks the unlabeled data points very specifically to, to address those deficiencies. So it's very selective about how much and what exactly data should be labeled by humans. The system itself becomes proactive in choosing what the human should provide advice on. And so we can, uh, we can expect the, the system to pick the most controversial cases or the most uncertain cases, and then human with their expertise can help resolve that. Another radical solution to the lack of labeling resources and the hunger for lots of training data in AI systems uh, is currently popular. It goes under the code name of weak supervision. And this is, instead of going to, to our uh, healthcare partners and asking them to go point by point through the data, um, we ask them, uh, if you were to perform that task of labeling data, what kind of rules would you use to decide whether this case is healthy and this case is unhealthy? How would you approach this? And we take notes. We collect those rules. We put them together in a, in a consistent probabilistic system. And then we apply the sets of rules that they provide, that we harvest from the, from the, from the experts, uh, and automatically label perhaps very large amounts of data. Um, now, this is very cheap, but it's also interesting and exposes other, other, other opportunities that I'm going to mention in a moment. But I mentioned just three tricks. There, there, are, there are many more. There is uh, self-supervision. There is N or K-shot learning uh, or one-shot learning. There, is also there are also approaches that uh, look at uh, generating artificial training data by data augmentation where you get your actual examples from the field and, and then you modify them slightly by noisifying or rotating images and such to artificially um, um, inflate the size of the training data sets. So they are all good and the number of different approaches and the amount of work being done in uh, AI research community is indicative that the community has recognized this as a problem and is working hard to, to resolve it so that we can we cannot be limited as much as we are right now by the lack of training data. Uh, next slide. Another challenge that pops up is, but can we trust the training data that we collected in the field from experts? Uh, we assume it's grand truth, and we often just go forward with our projects without, without thinking much about it. So one example to just give you a hint about this. Imagine you're, you were tasked with a, with a somewhat uh, strange task of assessing biological age of a person based on their facial image. When you look at this uh, picture of this gentleman, if you're asked to exactly pinpoint their age with a resolution of one year, that's going to be uh, a difficult task. And maybe you won't feel very confident giving that, the answer to this question, because at certain range of ages, it's kind of hard to pinpoint this. So the result will be uh, frustration from the data annotator, and also the quality of the resulting ground truth data will be limited. It will be carrying lots of noise. And therefore, the downstream models that you want to build from that data will be subjected to the same kind of challenges of noise, right? However, if we reformulate this question, next slide, and instead of showing just one picture, show pictures of two people and ask who looks older, that question is actually much more easy to answer confidently and faster and with less frustration, and also introduces less noise to the training data. So this is just one trick on how we can increase the quality of the labels. Next slide. Another big challenge is, so OK, we train these models. We want to hand over these models for you to use in practice. Do you trust them? So one example is a black box uh, decision support system that hypothetically advises the surgeon to amputate the right leg of a patient. Uh, any any uh, person with common sense would question that recommendation and ask why. 
with some of our uh, techniques that we use these days for, for AI, we can actually somewhat answer that question. But with the mainstream, that's not an easy uh, task for them. They have a hard time answering questions of why. Um, even more difficult question for some of those systems is um, how confident you are about this recommendation. Uh, in most cases, the best we can do these days is to answer this probabilistically. Say, we are 95% confident. A really quizzical doctor and nurse would, uh, would then ask, how about the remaining 5%? And because our field is uh, so dependent on statistical machine learning these days, we honestly don't have a good answer other than statistical. If you look at the roots of AI, on the other hand, it was all about mathematical logic. It was not about statistics. We, we use statistics later on when we realize that this mathematical logic makes it difficult to use in applications of or, or our solutions. So, so we kind of switched to statistics for, confidence, uh, for, for convenience. Now you are facing this challenge. So now some of us are bringing back uh, the logic to the, to, the, to, the, to the front and allow us to, uh, to apply this. This is very important because our systems tend to make very, tiny er very big errors in response to tiny changes of, on, of the input features. Uh, they sometimes defy common sense. Once you see the system solve a very difficult for human problem very well, and the next minute you expose it to a problem that perhaps human being would consider trivial, and they will fail miserably. I don't like that. We need to fix this. So basically, this is the field of trustworthy AI, and the good news is we are working on it. Next slide. And then, of course, there are humans. Humans can also screw things up if you let them, right? And we want humans to be part of this, of this process. Next slide. But the biggest problem with humans these days is we don't have enough of them. We don't have enough experts that will build AI solutions so that the US remains competitive, remains the leader of this field worldwide. But we also don't have people at the bottom of this pyramid, the people who will be informed users, who will know how to use these capabilities to benefit our society. Uh, the good news is military is already aware of this. This is a slide borrowed from Army AI Integration Center, uh, part of the Army Futures Command. And so they are working to, to solve those uh, deficiencies in staffing. Next slide. Uh, there are also uh, attempts to automate some of the more mundane processes in AI so that we can scale our capabilities without necessarily bringing more people to the table. And I think these two initiatives should go together because we have so many gaps that prevent us from deploying everything everywhere at all times. Next slide. And this is uh, my final slide I wanted to leave you with. Uh, this, I think, nicely summarizes the topics we covered today. Um, between how we chose it and I, because you will see a robot there, you will see AI there, of, of course not with your own eyes, but it's there, and you see a human, and we want all those three together. Uh, so behind this is actually a movie I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask to run in a second, uh, but this movie is about 10 years old now. It's an example of a successful application of brain-computer interfaces technology. So this lady was paralyzed completely, uh, legs and, and, and hands not working. And uh, her own neural network was wired with some electrodes. You see those little boxes sticking uh, from her head on the top. And, and her neural network was wired to the controller of this robotic arm. And she learned how to control this robotic arm. And she's feeding herself a, a bar of uh, chocolate. Uh, paraphrasing a uh, famous quote, uh, uh, one small nibble for a woman, one giant bite for BCI arm. Can we please run a movie? And that will be it for me. I just have to say it verbally. I know it was fast. Yep. <laughs> 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 that worked. <laughs> 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 on my hand. Oh, Drop it. There we go. Good. Hey, we can stop. Thank you very much. Three squares, yeah. One small. One small devil for a woman. One giant bite for DCR. Thank you. You can stop. Thank you very much.